Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Tank Online. It's good to see you. Hey, this morning, let me tell you how things are gonna work. We're playing a pre-recorded message right now, but some of our leaders are in the chat ready to discuss with you if you're watching this live with us. We're taking a look this morning about how we fill in the blanks about what we assume about other people. We think we figured them out, but really that can just be damaging to them and to you and to our community. And so before we do that though, just let us know that you're here in the comments. Just type your name um, and then I encourage you to answer the questions that we throw out in the chat. If you're not watching live with us, you can just answer them on your own, in your own mind, or you can uh, kind of answer them in the comment section. Finally, why don't you just go ahead and invite someone to watch this with you. Shoot a text to one of your friends and have them visit the tank.online.church or share this video with someone you think would dig it after you watch it. Okay, ready to go? Awesome. Okay, go with me on this. Before they shut them down because of COVID-19, malls were kind of a dying thing. Everyone can shop online now, but I still think that they're fascinating places. Besides the fact that it is high quality grade A people watching location, the malls are a place where hundreds of very different brands with completely different vibes sit side by side. Maybe you've never thought about brands having vibes or personalities, or reputations, but they do. Think about it, there's a difference between Nike and Sperry, right? Even though they both sell shoes, you instantly know which one is which when you walk by. Or what about Urban Outfitters and H&M? They literally sell the same products to the same age people, but there's just something different about them. And here's why I think that's fascinating. Companies spend billions of dollars each year trying to control those brands' reputations. The, the look, the smell, the thing they're known for. Those aren't accidents, they're carefully decided. Here's what I mean. I'm gonna read you a reputation and you tell me which brand it is in the chat. Okay, so I know that there's some debate over some of these things, but here's the point. Companies hire hundreds of people and spend billions of dollars trying to shape something that every one of us has, but most of us spend very little time thinking about, our reputation. Our reputations are made up of all sorts of things and bring out all kinds of assumptions about who we are. Just think about the various groups of folks at school. You remember school? And the assumptions you've made about people who are part of them. Now do this with me, fill in the blank in your head here. Don't type these things in the chat. This isn't the time to be the funny kid. What are some of the assumptions that you've made about these groups of people? All right, even though we don't say them out loud, or at least we shouldn't, we all tend to fill in the blanks about other people. And I think we do this as a way to assume that we know what to expect from them, what they're capable of, and how they'll respond in any situation. One of the things humans like to do is just put people in categories to understand them. But the danger is how we fill in the blank now determines what we expect from them next. Whether we know the person or not doesn't matter. We know their reputation or we build one for them in our minds based on a single action or a single person in their group. And that's dangerous. And it also isn't a teenager thing. This is a human thing, like we all do it. So where do these assumptions come from? Well, I think they come from a lot of places, um, but the following two really stand out the most. The first is experiences. We have experiences of what someone like them did or said to us 
and we use those experiences experiences to prejudge what the next person's like. And the second is insecurities. Sometimes our assumptions are formed from our insecurities. The person we're filling in the blank for has something that we want or we wish we had. For example, they have a starting position on a team or they have a house that your family could never really afford and that's annoying. And we automatically assume the worst about them because they remind us of how far we feel from being the best. And that's insecurity. So let's take a look at a couple things that are happening right now. But first, uh, let me have you fill in a couple more blanks. And don't just, and don't do this in the chat, just take note about what your response is. You ready? Go. Did you have a visceral response to one or the other? Me personally, I'm a mask guy. Um, I'm trusting scientists for help in something that I really don't understand and don't see the requirement to wear one as an infringement on my personal freedom. But I do have friends that think the exact opposite of me and they're entitled to that right. And you know, if, if I were to fill in the blank of someone who refuses to wear a mask based on my bad experiences in the past, I would probably say that they're a right wing crazy person that doesn't believe in science or believes they're a conspiracy to take away all of our freedoms and they're, they're coming for our guns next. Or if I filled in the blank on someone who refuses to wear a mask, mask based on my insecurities, I'd probably say that they're arrogant snobs that think they're better than me and everyone else and so that they can go on their boats and live their lives while the rest of us are stuck at home. But neither of those responses are responses of love. Whether I'm justified in my previous experience or right in my perception, neither of those positions are actually helpful in my relationship with those people. In fact, I wanna warn you now, if you're making assumptions about people based primarily out of bad experiences or personal insecurities, you will find yourself alone and or a thorn in the community that you live in. And here's the thing, God has given us some advice and a model on how to fill in the blanks we have about people. And not just the people that look like us and think like us, but the ones that look different and think different too. See, God asks us to let love fill in the blanks here on your opinions about all people. 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight is a famous section in the Bible. It's usually read at weddings, but I think that we should probably read it every time we open Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook. 1 Corinthians says this, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So if that's love, then before you fill in the blank on someone, you better make sure that your answer is letting love fill it in. Because here's the deal, if you follow God, there are a few things that you believe. And one of those things is the belief that nothing can separate you from his love. Nothing you say, nothing you do, nothing that happens to you, nothing that you think about doing, nothing that your friends do, nothing that your family does, nothing. And that's a good feeling, isn't it? The other thing that we believe then is that that's the same reality for everyone else. So if, if that's the case for other people too, then when you unload on someone face to face or assume the worst in someone and gossip about that person without, being, without it being from a place of love, it damages the individual and creates a toxic culture uh, for everyone in the community for that person to be damaged again. So one last thing before I get off my soapbox here, imagine being that person who's been assumed. Maybe some of you have, and not assumed in a loving way, and you get wind of it, of what people are saying, and you imagine um, listening to those things and reading those things, that's gotta hurt, it's gotta be painful, it's gotta be infuriating. Others have basically drawn a line in the stand, pointed a finger and said, you're on the wrong side. Think like us and act like us, otherwise get out. You're crazy, you're alone, you're stupid. How different is that feeling where God, than from where God loves you no matter what you've done and what you've said, or what's been done to you, or what's been done around you? So if you're someone who believes in God, you have to let love fill in the blanks and not draw lines because it affects other people's understanding of God's love for them. It's a big deal. And so when you fill in the blank on someone, let it be a patient one. One that takes a long time before anything is decided on. Let it be a kind one. Let it be one that isn't birthed out of any kind of envy for that person. Uh, one that isn't triggered by any anger that you have for someone like them. 
Let it be one that isn't looking to get even or hoping to hurt that person physically or socially or emotionally, but rather let it be an answer that seeks to understand the other person first, to protect their sense of value as a human being, to trust in other people to do the same, and to hope that they understand that nothing they say or do will separate them from God's love. Our limited experiences and insecurities cause us to fill in the blanks and convince ourselves way too quickly that we know way more about somebody or something than we actually do. So how do we resist the temptation to do this to others? See, there, there's a moment from Jesus' life that I think may be able to help us. Jesus was in the middle of a tense encounter with some of the religious leaders of Israel at the time. These teachers of the law um, were called Pharisees, and they were a big deal in the religious circles. They had a brand of self-righteousness that they thought set them apart from everyone else. Pretty snobby. So when Jesus came around and started spending time with people the religious leaders had branded as sinners, or people who weren't as close to God as they were, things got tense. They actually started trying to catch Jesus off guard with questions that they hoped would prove that he was just a phony. They wanted him to slip up and answer something in a way that took away his credibility and made him look bad. And so during one of these encounters, after some people had gathered to listen to Jesus teach in the temple, the religious leaders caught a woman in a R-rated situation. So they, they dragged her out in front of Jesus to see how he would handle the punishment. And I think that what unfolds here shows us a different way to live instead of filling in the blanks about other people's reputations. Check it out. Early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered round him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and they made her stand before them all. Teacher! This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now, what do you say? Okay, pause. Right, don't miss this. The, the text here says that this woman had been caught in the act. She was literally committing adultery when the leaders found her. Uh, we can assume that she was pretty al already pretty humiliated and that the law demanded that people respond by literally throwing rocks at her until she died. I don't understand it. And also last time I, you know what? It takes two people at least to commit adultery. So where's the dude, right? From the beginning, we get the sense that this wasn't about justice at all, but about something else. It's, it's pretty obvious that the religious leaders wanted to make Jesus choose in front of a crowd of people. He was going to overlook the woman's obvious sin and ignore the law of Moses, which would take away the credibility as his teacher, as a teacher and anger the religious leaders, or would he allow her to be stoned, causing the crowd to turn on him? It was a trap. The leaders knew it was a trap and that was the point. But look what happens next. As they stood there asking him questions, he straightened up. Whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. When they heard this, they all left, one by one, the older ones first. Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened up. Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir. 
Well, then, I do not condemn you either. Go. But do not sin again. I'm not sure we can fully understand the tension of this moment. These religious leaders who built their brand on appearing better than everybody else and pointing out the sins of others are totally put in their place. Basically, Jesus is saying, you're quick to point out what everyone else has gotten wrong, but what about you? Have you ever gotten anything wrong? And then one by one, these leaders realize that their plans backfired, and Jesus kindly and lovingly releases the woman who's literally afraid for her life and tells her to go in freedom and live her life differently. Can you imagine? Right? Don't miss this. Everyone here was guilty of something, both the religious leaders and this woman. And Jesus had a message for both of them. What is possible for your future isn't determined by your past. Not if you're a Pharisee and not if you're the woman. Both are guilty and both are free to go. Both had a reputation for being one way and both can choose to live differently than they arrived. And Jesus challenged the woman to change by saying, go and sin no more. Because no matter her reputation, he believed change was possible for her. It was such a Jesus move. He changed everything because he responded in love to everyone in the situation. And it's, it's exactly what you and I should be about too. But isn't it true that sometimes we're more on brand with the religious leaders? Like we don't fill in the blanks well. We do it based off the behavior of that one time. Or uh, we tend to assume that we already know what's gonna happen next and we know their story because of what's happened before. But Jesus' approach to the situation in the story teaches us something different. The woman who had a brand, a reputation for being bad, who everyone judged based on this one thing that she had done, saw her as more than that one thing. He believed something was possible for her future, no matter her past. He didn't write a story about who she was because of what she had been caught doing. He didn't fill in the blank for her even though he knew everything about her. He saw her as a whole person. And as a whole person, he saw her as, a deserving, as, as deserving of another chance. Jesus proved that we are more than the assumptions or judgments that others make of us. We're worthy of forgiveness and grace and a second chance because his love for us. And we should extend that same grace and forgiveness and love to others too. So before we move on, what are some questions that you have or questions or thoughts that you have from this story? So dream with me for a moment. What if this was the approach that you and I started to take when forming our opinions about other people? What if instead of filling in the blanks with assumptions and judgments, we chose to believe that anyone could radically change? What if we believed anyone could surprise us and be far better than we think they are? What if we chose to let love fill in the blank? Because when we fill in the blank with judgment or hate, we only, we're only seeing part of that person, their actions, whatever they did that was wrong or something that we don't like. But when we fill in the blank with love, we're seeing others as humans, more than what they haven't done or have done, but as individuals, as people whose story isn't over. And so when opportunities are for assumptions and judgments start flying at you, can you take these steps toward a new approach? First, just stop and think about how others have filled in the blanks about you and how that's made you feel. When you make an assumption uh, about someone, about how they are or what they do, just stop. Think about your own life, how people have underestimated you, how they've judged you. How have you experienced the other side of someone filling in that blank? Remember, Jesus', Jesus forgiveness brought you to a place where your life started to change for, a, for the better. And so treat other people the way that Jesus treated you, with grace and love. Second thing, 
Think about how you've wrongly filled in the blanks for someone else. Who is someone that you think you know, but you really don't? Who have you filled in the blanks in for in a negative way without learning the whole story of that person? What if you chose to fill in the blanks about them with Jesus's brand of compassion? What if you chose to let love fill in the blank for uh, what we think about someone now and what we expect for them in the future? See, we all need to ease up on our assumptions and judgments. But as followers of Jesus, let us never assume that someone doesn't belong or that you don't belong or that people will never change or that people like that or people like you or me will always be bleh, right? Because as easy as it is to do those things, it takes the Christ out of Christianity. There's no Jesus in those ideas and therefore no love. Jesus never fills in the blank with never. There's always hope for change. And so when we choose to follow Jesus' example and take these steps, we're choosing to let love fill in the blank instead of our quick or shallow assumptions and judgments about who they are now and who they can become. And if this is really what Jesus is about, doesn't that cause you to be a little bit more interested in his brand? It does for me. And so if you want something very practical that this can be applied to now, um, and also an example of how ugly things can get if we don't let love fill in the blanks, look up this story. If you haven't heard it already, look up the story of Ahmaud Arbery. He was a young black man that was shot on the streets in his neighborhood in Georgia. Go and read all the things of people filling in the blanks about him and who they thought he was and about who the people, who they thought the people that shot him was. There's hardly any voice out there being said um, that's filling in the blanks with love. And so to close this up, thanks for hanging with me. I want to encourage us encourage you to be people who let love fill in the blank about others. And when we do this, we'll be known um, by our love for others, just as just like Jesus was, um, had intended for us to be. And maybe, just maybe, our world will be a little bit better. Amen? Amen. All right, here are some questions for you to discuss. Thanks all. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Until next time, peace. Remember to follow us on Instagram and get involved or show up in your small group meeting to further the process of chatting about this more. We love you. Bye.